New Center Maine presents Agree to Disagree with Phil Harriman and Ethan Strimling, an ongoing podcast on Maine politics. Phil, a Republican, and Ethan, a Democrat, are two of Maine's most well-known and respected political analysts. Every week and sometimes daily, get new episodes discussing all things political and how it affects Mainers like you. And now, here's Phil and Ethan. Welcome to a mini pod of the Agree to Disagree podcast on News Center with Phil and Ethan. Phil, have you gotten any sleep since election night? Oh man, I I finally got to bed about 1:30 uh, Wednesday morning and tossed and turned until about three, and then had to get up and go to my real job in the financial planning space at 7:30. So no. Basically, no. How about you? And then you had to do radio with me at eight oh eight just to <laughs> right. really get going. Yeah, I a uh, little different. I didn't get to bed till about two thirty, and that's because we were waiting on Portland results. But I fell asleep quickly. But then I woke up at like six, and you know, just my mind was spinning with what was going on around the country in terms of the presidential race. So, yeah, I did not get much sleep. Uh, I did get a little nap in yesterday, and then last night uh, I was. I was comatose, so I, I, I'm not caught up yet, but I'm getting there. So Boy, every, every minute on the internet, things change, huh? Really? So what do I owe the honor of this connection? Well, I thought maybe we'd do just a quick little mini pod. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff out there that's uh, undecided at the moment, but I thought maybe we could talk about a few things. Very clear, Collins a uh, historic win. Uh, we also, of course, Dale Crafts, a lot closer than people expected, right. but yeah. Golden won that race. Interesting dynamic in Maine that always happens that I thought it might be fun for us to talk about, uh, how Maine always seems to split. You know, we vote for Joe Biden for president and Susan Collins for U.S. Senate. The Maine House goes uh, a little more Republican. The Maine Senate goes more Democratic. It's this weird schizophrenia in Maine I'm wondering if you being bored and bred here since 1712 or something, you might be able to give me some kind of answer. Well, uh, it goes then, back uh, all the way to uh, back in my uh, unexpected state Senate victory. Uh, Bill Clinton won Maine over George Bush and Phil Harriman uh, won over the incumbent state senator. And did your district vote for Bill Clinton and you? Yeah, uh, they did. Yes, wow. Indeed. See, that, that's the interest. So we're yeah. going to dive into that a little bit. Uh, and there was a uh, political earthquake in the city of Portland this week in which uh, I a bunch of that, unexpected referenda passed. I felt that all the way out in Yarmouth. <laughs> I'll bet. I'll bet. So we anyway, talk- so that's what we got on tap. Anything else you want to add? Or that no, no, like that's, a- that's probably more than we can uh, uh, inundate our loyal podcast viewers with. So let me stay, say it bluntly. Schoolsy, let's get started with this mini edition of New Center Maine's Agree to Disagree. As Speaker of the House, I solemnly and sadly open the debate All right, let's dive into the first one. Of course, the biggest race in the state of Maine, Susan Collins with an historic victory. First woman ever elected to a fifth term in the United States Senate. When all is said and done, she will be one of the longest serving senators in U.S. history for the state of Maine. Phil, how did this happen? I think it was to be from the beginning, you know, this this onslaught of uh, financial oligarchs pumping money through Sarah Gideon's campaign, claiming that Susan Collins was not for you anymore. And she's more about Washington, D.C. than the state of Maine uh, proved to be not the case. In fact, uh, the pollsters got it wrong, in my view, from the beginning. And had they got it right? We would probably have not seen these $100 million campaign efforts uh, pile onto the people of the state of Maine. Well, I certainly agree with you that, uh, you know, the the pollsters didn't get it right. And you were very consistent from the beginning that you didn't believe the numbers that we were seeing. Kudos to you on that for sure. Uh, I always take a little bit of umbrage with your talking about the money on Sarah Gideon's side, but not the money on Susan Collins' side. Uh, she, in the end, will, you know, the the out 
the uh, the super PACs will have spent just as much to protect her. I do think the race was competitive. I don't think there's any way to say that this was an inevitable ending. Susan Collins is tough to beat. I will tell you from the beginning, I always thought she was going to be hard. Uh, I didn't. I would never have put money on Sarah Gideon until about the last month, and I started feeling it, and I was like, oh, I think she's going to take this. But boy, in the end, uh, you're right. Susan Collins, just a mammoth of Maine politics, withstands her toughest fight ever. She deserves a little uh, less, little R and R, I would say. Well, I, I had the chance to uh, speak with her for a few minutes uh, the day after the election, and she told me that she put almost seven thousand miles on her campaign bus from Madawaska to Kittery, and she said every time I stepped off the bus. I got a very different feel from the people who came up and spoke to me than what I was hearing through the media and the pollsters. And she said something else, Ethan, that I think is remarkable, and that is almost every place I stopped, I could point to someone or something that I, I had done from my district of Maine. And it really was uh, disingenuous to suggest that I had lost touch. Literally every time I walked into any community, I could point to someone or something that I had done to help my constituents. And so I think in the end, um, that's what carried her is that she is from Maine and she has stayed connected to me. Yeah, I think, I don't think the from Maine thing um, is significant. I, I think that kind of language around people from away doesn't, you know, we have two, we have a US Senator who's not born and raised in Maine. We have a member of the ho uh, U.S. House not born and raised in Maine. I, I don't think that impacts. I do think you're right. I think Susan Collins is very good at constituent work. That's what she leaned into. And Democrats made a mistake to really try to nationalize this race, to make it about Mitch McConnell, to make it about right. uh, Donald Trump. They should have really made it about bread and butter issues and made it clear that it, it was votes that Susan Collins had taken that were most problematic in terms of her being out of touch. Uh, but I think nationalizing the race made it very tough uh, for Sarah Gideon to win. So very, you know, it's, I, I hope that Sarah Gideon, you know, look, she ran a good race. Uh, she's had good public service in the state of Maine. She's got a bright future. I really appreciate all that she brought to the table in that. Um, she deserves some R&R &R as well. Well, that plus she's got probably, well, I don't know, but I would say millions of dollars left over in her campaign war chest that she now can use for, uh, kingdom building, politically speaking, here in Maine. Well, she can. She could also, you know, use it to maybe build. You know, suit, um, Olympia Snow, of course, had millions when she was done, and she used that to create a really valuable foundation. George Mitchell did some similar work. Yeah. Sarah Gideon might do the same, or you know, she might prepare for the next race. Who knows? Right. Right. Okay, Ethan. Golden crafts. Golden crafts. Strim, why was this so close? Well, of course, you're talking about the Jared Golden race yes. uh, versus uh, Dale Crafts. This race, everybody was predicting uh, would be much, uh, much wider. This was the kind of race that was just the opposite. Everybody thought that Golden was going to win this race substantially. Uh, and of course, it came in at well below 10 points, probably six six points around in the end, five or six points. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know exactly why this was so close. One theory I have is that, um, you know, Donald Trump came to Maine all those times at the end. It, it was a mistake from my perspective in terms of trying to win the electoral vote. He needed Pennsylvania way more than he needed Maine. He needed Georgia, which now, of course, is still in play. He needed Arizona or Nevada. These were much bigger prizes. And to come to Maine that much, I think it it certainly pushed Republican turnout in the second CD much stronger. That helped Susan Collins. That helped Dale Crafts uh, in a race where it looked like he was just going to get pummeled. He came out much closer. Well, I, I have to eat some humble pie. I, I saw it like you. There was not enough energy and uh, money in that campaign to compete with an incumbent uh, congressman who, for the most part, seems to have a good relationship with his constituents in the second congressional district. Uh, what, I, what I think has uh, come to the forefront as a result of the uh, election is that uh, I spent a fair amount of time off and on since last May in the second congressional district. And as we discussed on Political Brew and on Agree to Disagree, that I, I was convinced that 
uh, Trump had a very strong support in the second congressional district and the election uh, proved that to be accurate. But I, I think what may have been under the radar screen is that voters in the second congressional district who were uh, strongly in favor of support also remembered that Jared Golded voted to impeach President Trump. And that may be part of the reason why Dale Kraft did so well. You know, that's interesting, actually. Uh, you may be right about that. I mean, he split his vote on impeachment. I think he's been pretty middle of the road on a lot of votes, not voting for a couple of the stimulus package that were packages that were put through the House. Uh, you know, I, I think in this one, we probably should have listened to our instincts and not the polls a little more. These races in the second CD are never blowouts. You know, they're never 15 or 20 points. You know, maybe Mike Michaud had a couple of those after he'd been there for a decade running against somebody who wasn't working very hard. Uh, but I think we kind of just saw those polls and said, oh, maybe this will be a different kind of year because Jared's tried to be more moderate down down the middle of the road. Uh, but clearly that didn't happen. And, and look, the National Republican Party's got to be kicking themselves. This is a six point race when they pulled out hundreds of thousands of dollars for the final three weeks. Imagine if they'd have moved some of that money into that race and right. actually might have picked up a seat. Well, you, you raise an interesting point, and that is that Jared Golden is going to go back to the U.S. House of Representatives. He's going to discover that Nancy Pelosi's power has been somewhat diminished because they, the Republicans actually picked up seats in the U.S. House. He's got to keep his finger on the pulse of how conservative his district is while he operates in a caucus in the National Democrat Party that is pretty liberal. He's got to continue to make sure that his votes represent the people in the second district. That's going to be a tightrope for him to walk. Number three. So, Phil, this interesting dynamic that we have in the state of Maine, the, we voted for Susan Collins. We voted for Joe Biden. Maybe you can see that because those races are national. But when you look even at the local races in the state of Maine, the Maine House of Representatives, Democrats lost 11 seats. Republicans picked them up. But in the Maine Senate, Democrats expanded their majority so that now they have the largest majority since, nine, since the 1980s. Now, both bodies are still Democratic, of course, but such an interesting split Explain to me why Mainers are uh, so schizophrenic. Well, this is another one where I, I have to eat some humble pie. I actually agreed with you that Democrats would pick up seats in, in the House. I thought we would actually gain one in, in, the, in the Senate. And the rationale behind that is we had, what, 24 seats of, out of 186 that were up for election that there wasn't a Republican candidate. And as it turns out, uh, the Republicans recruited in those 11 races really good candidates, and they supported them through the uh, campaign process, and the results showed on election evening. Now, what's going to happen is that the House of Representatives, who's going to have a new speaker, Sarah Gideon is not going to be there. Democrats are going to have an even thinner margin to exercise their uh, political priorities meaning Republicans are going to be much more engaged and much more uh, at the table when decisions need to be made. Yeah, I mean, remember, Democrats still have a pretty significant majority. I mean, they've got 80 seats in the House, a couple independents will probably caucus with them. So that's a, you know going to be a 13 to 15 seat majority. So that's still pretty strong. They'll get through most of what they want to do. Uh, that's for sure. They don't have two thirds to do constitutional amendments or anything like that. Uh, you know, I, I think part of the dynamic here is uh, the Tip O'Neill phrase, all politics is local. Yeah. And in Maine, that is really true. Our districts are small. I mean, a member of the House represents 8,500 people, member of the Senate, 35,000. You get to know everybody in your district. You can knock on doors. And I think that personal touch is really important to Mainers. Uh, in this year, uh, there probably was a little bit less of that. Uh, because of COVID and whatnot. That's something that Democrats are really good at usually. You know, they wear out the soles of their shoes. That's kind of their style, our style. Um, so it's interesting. But I think the politics is local. The personal touch that you can get on those local races is is why it really doesn't matter if you're a D or an R in most places in Maine. Not in Portland, of course, but in other places. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> well, I, 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 let me go back to that 
uh, point you made about the Democrats still have a healthy majority of 13 or let's say 14 seats. All you need to do is to move half of those. So that's seven on any given day because someone's not able to attend the House session or their district doesn't uh, align with the agenda of the speaker or the majority leader in the House. And you're going to have uh, a tough time if you're a Democrat pushing your agenda through unless you include the Republicans along the way. And that's before anything can get to over to the Senate, where I do understand there's sort of a veto proof majority over there and before it gets to the governor. So now House Republicans really do have uh, a, a significant weight in what moves forward and what doesn't. Yeah, they have a more significant weight, but that goes both ways, too. I mean, if you get a Republican, you know, the, only the most partisan issues kind of go straight down the line. A lot of issues people, you know, go over the line. There's usually four or five both ways. Uh, you know, I want to get back to a point you actually made, which I think is kind of interesting. We all believed that the Republican strategy to leave seats empty was a mistake when maybe now that we look at it, the Republican strategy was smart. You know, they didn't run people in places like Portland uh, against Democrats where they're just never going to win. And so they said, all right, let's put our all of our energy and let's not be distracted at all by some candidate in Portland who thinks they finally got a shot, giving me calls all the time saying, why aren't you putting money in my district? Uh, let's focus really on those. And maybe that's kind of why they, you know, maybe it's a new strategy for Maine politics. May I just remind you before we move on, when you say a Republican will never get elected in Portland, uh, the proud heritage of Percival Baxter, a Republican from Portland, left us the greatest gift Maine has ever received, Baxter State Park. So, And when was that? <laughs> what year uh, was that? That was a little bit before I served there. Yeah, a little bit before. <laughs> Oh boy, referenda, referenda, referenda. Strim, was there an earthquake I felt all the way out in Yarmouth on, on Tuesday night in Portland? Boy, was there ever, my friend. Just as a reminder to our uh, viewers and our listeners, there were five referenda put on the ballot that were very strong progressive policies around protecting working people, building affordable housing, reversing climate change, very aggressive policy. And you know, we put them out there and, you know, we expected we'd do well. We thought that Maine people, Portland people certainly agreed with them, but we knew it was going to be an uphill fight. A million dollars was spent against these policies. The entire city council opposed them. The mayor, who's popular or was popular a couple months ago, was in social media ads, press conferences, mailers, just pushing against these. And four out of five won overwhelmingly. And the fifth one that didn't win that one only lost by 235 votes. You know, these are, uh, if I can just say it, these are policies that um, I put in front of the council over the four years I served in City Hall and time and again, they rejected them saying, this is not what the people of Portland want. Very clear Tuesday night, council's got to eat some crow. Yeah, uh, congratulations to you and your colleagues who uh, put this uh, on the ballot and uh, the, the results speak for themselves. I, I didn't think Portland would adopt uh, all of those referendums and the fact that the other one was, was close, which I actually thought that's the one I did think would pass <laughs> along with facial recognition, which was the short-term uh, rental question. So now we're going to find out, uh, are these policies really going to uh, make the city of Portland uh, more livable, more affordable, uh, uh, and, and the the policies around the green initiatives going to make a difference so that Portland actually becomes the model of how the main economy and perhaps even the national economy should operate. Yeah, it's really interesting to, you know, to finally really have an opportunity to put in place some strong progressive policy and see what those impacts are and put them together in total. You know, it is disappointing that the short term rental didn't pass. That's an important piece that goes in it's connected to the Green New Deal, connected to the uh, rent control piece. But I mean, think about it. 17,000 units are now going to be protected by rent control. 20,000 workers in the city are going to see a raise from the minimum wage increase. Uh, we expect that hundreds of more units of affordable housing are going to come onto the market um, within the next five years. Th this really is going to be uh, you know, a, a, a place where you can see how this policy impacts the community. And 
uh, and then down the road, figure out ways you can even strengthen it. Or admit that uh, your vision of grandeur was that just a, uh, a vision and we're going to have to do some backtracking. It'll be very interesting to see how the voters and the, uh, the people who drive the economy react to these new referendums that are going to be implemented, what, within months? Within 30 days. And it'll be interesting to see how workers react. You know, I have for long believed when you bring up the minimum wage, that means workers want to come to the city. It means employers have a better opportunity to hire some of the best workers. So you better watch out in Yarmouth. All your workers are going to be coming to us, buddy. <laughs> well, I, I, and I hope you're right. I hope you're right. All right, my friend, look at that. That was our quick wrap up on uh, election day. What we saw next week, we will make sure to have another full episode and we can figure out which one of us ate less crow from our <laughs> nailed it or failed it predictions. Woo! That's going to be a rough one. You and I both are going to have yep. to uh, put on our ponchos, I think. So, so yep. <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, that was a fun one for sure. The clock has run out. The buzzer is sounding. Oh, before we go, uh, can we ask uh, Donald, how did we do? And you're fake news. Category you are fake news. <laughs> are we going to keep using that if Donald doesn't win uh, the presidential? Uh, are they going to keep us on this podcast? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good, without Donald Trump, is there anything to talk about? <laughs> we'll have sleep. Don't be rude. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we could keep the sound bite. Have a I'll great see, weekend, my friend. Get a little more yeah. sleep. All the best. Thanks.